the NRL 22 June 2020 Course of Fire, this week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by MDT. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and this Monday we are going to talk about the National Rifle League 22 June 2020 Course of Fire. So I was really happy this last weekend to get out to the Westside Sportsman's Club here in Evansville, Indiana, and actually get to shoot an NRL 22 Course of Fire again. Uh, this is the first one that I've shot since the whole pandemic kicked off. Uh, so it was nice to get out, shoot this format again, uh, see some people I hadn't seen in a while. And uh, this time I took out my uh, youngest boy, uh, Andrew. He is 12. Uh, so this was really only his second NRL 22 match. Uh, and he is getting used to it now, getting used to running the uh, Ruger uh, precision rim fire that I have seen in front of me. And, uh, so it was a really good time. We had a uh, slightly overcast day, had thunderstorms that were threatening, but they thankfully held off all morning for us to actually get the shoot in. Now, our local club, we shot the five uh, sanctioned stages uh, that are part of the regular monthly NRL 22 match. Uh, and then we had two side stages to proof our uh, rooftop prop uh, that uh, myself and Neil Burnett uh, built for the local club. That way, uh, we could make sure that it's good to go before it's actually part of an official course of fire. Uh, and then we also had uh, a spinner, which uh, 22 spinners are incredibly fun to try to shoot uh, that was part of a uh, another side stage. Uh, but we are going to talk about the main courses of fire, uh, how I did, and uh, my uh, general insights on them. Uh, now, this is also the first NRL 22 match that I have shot since they instituted the one piece of equipment rule uh, for this season, and we outlined that rule in a previous video, and I'll go ahead and pop that in a link above and down in the description down below. Uh, so the one piece of equipment rule, if you are running a rail equipped rifle and you wanted to run something like a rail changer or uh, any of the other stuff, gamer plates, that kind of thing, um, you can run a gamer plate and a bag and those have to remain together as one piece. Uh, so you can't start the stage with a gamer plate and a bag and then halfway through switch it to the rear, which is kind of important for this one because there was a ladder stage where you could actually uh, try to game it that way and get a significant advantage. Uh, so we discussed that. We made sure we complied with that. Uh, but... Uh, Overall, it was a really good time. So we're going to go ahead and kick this off. I'll talk about the course of fire, and then afterwards I'm going to talk about uh, the Ruger Precision Rim Fire and uh, my continuing opinion on that. Uh, we still haven't got the full review of it, but there are umpteen jillion reviews of the Ruger Precision Rim Fire out there. I'm just going to outline my thoughts in this, and hopefully we'll get a full review out in the next week or two on it. So the first uh, stage for the actual June 2020 course of fire is called Can You Beat the Clock? And uh, it is a 120 second time limit, 10 rounds. Uh, the targets are a 0.25 inch and a 0.5 inch target on a KYL rack at 30 yards. And then at 50 yards, a 0.75 inch and a one inch target on the KYL. Um, the points are 10 points per impact. But here's the difference from uh, previous uh, stages. Uh, this one has a plus one-tenth of a second bonus point per second remaining. So if you had 8.0 seconds remaining on the clock, you would earn 0 .87, sec or 0 0.87 points. Uh, so what this was intended to do, because there were no paper stages in uh, this month's match, uh, this is intended to help separate the field. Um, usually uh, NRL 22 would use a paper stage because the scoring rings allow you to get a little bit more granular on that and uh, the paper stage would generally help separate the field so you don't have 10 winners who clean the entire course of fire. Um, 
This uh, kind of does the same thing while eliminating the paper, which I really like. Uh, you guys have heard me comment in the past. I really don't like the paper stages. Um, they take time to score. Um, if you are running in wet or rainy environments, then your, your paper just disintegrates and you have to use all kinds of tricks to keep it going in the rain. Uh, so I kind of like this. Uh, going forward, I will be interested to see how it does. Although it does uh, cause some, uh, some interesting uh, hiccups in scorekeeping with when you're using something like practice score or other electronic means. Uh, I don't do the practice score setup or scoring for our local clubs, so um, I'm really glad I don't have to mess with that side of it. Now, the equipment is one piece of equipment in accordance with the NRL 22 rules. Uh, and again, for this, uh, pretty much for all the stages of fire throughout this month, uh, I used a WeBad Mini Fortune Cookie. Uh, WeBad is a sponsor of the NRL 22, and the Mini Fortune Cookie is a great little piece of gear. Uh, if you were going to buy one bag uh, to start out, then either a pint size game changer or a WeBad Mini Fortune Cookie would be my recommendation there. Just really, really great pieces of equipment. So I shot the Voodoo V22. Uh, throughout this, and uh, my son shot the Ruger Precision Rim Fire. The start position on this was standing, rifle in hand, mag in, action open, and this was pretty much the start position for um, all of the courses of fire. The description is on the start signal, the shooter will drop into a prone supported position and engage the 0.5 and then the 0.25 with one round each. Shooter will then transition to support side and repeat the same engagement. Shooter will then transition back to the strong side and engage the 1 inch and 0.75 inch with one round each. Shooter will then transition to the support side and repeat same target engagement. Shooter will then transition back to the strong side and engage the 0.5 and then 0.25 with one shot each. Shooter must then verbally indicate they have completed the course of fire to stop the timer. Note, support side means support shoulder, eye, and firing hand. So a couple of important notes here. Um, support side for the purpose of NRL 22 when their courses of fire say support side they actually mean you need if you're a right-handed shooter so normally you would shoot with a buttstock in the right shoulder uh, you would shoot with your right hand on the pistol grip and right trigger finger actuating the trigger and you would have your right eye sighting through the scope so if you're a regular right-handed shooter Support side means the buttstock must be in your left shoulder. You must actuate the trigger with your left trigger finger and sight through the scope with your left eye. Uh, I say that because I have done this in the past on PRS competitions or Guardians or wherever. If they just simply say support side, uh, then very often I will just take the buttstock, move it to my opposite shoulder, use my left hand eye and left shoulder, and I will still run everything uh, with my right hand just like I normally would. That is generally the fastest for me. Um, however, for this one, Again, everything had to be on that support side, so you had to change up your pistol grip and your hand. So don't make that mistake and uh, get dinged for it. And lastly on this, um, they didn't specify how you could uh, indicate stopping your time. Uh, it seemed most of us did it with a some form of groan. Uh, to indicate that we had finished and not finished with a performance that we had wished. So this wasn't really that difficult because everything was prone. Uh, so you started out shooting strong side. Uh, you engage the rack that was closest at 30 yards from strong side. You switch to support side, engage that rack from support side. Uh, then you went out to the 50 yard strong side, 50 yard support side, came back uh, and strong side again. Um, the only trick here is to make sure that you are hitting the correct target first. Uh, so this, you were going big, small, big, small. Uh, so every time you were shooting, you were shooting the larger of the array first and then on to the smaller of the array. So you didn't want to get that mixed up and shoot the wrong target uh, because if you shoot the wrong target, even though it's an impact, it's still counted as a miss. Uh, so that was good. But then the other thing is, as soon as you were done shooting, uh, you need to indicate stop. Um, 
I lost some points on that because I didn't, as soon as I broke that 10th shot, I should have said stop. And that should have been it. Um, we're not using shot timers, so you can't look at the timer and see when the last shot broke. Uh, you're going off the verbal cue and then the timekeeper stopping the time and then looking at the display. Uh, so I lost a little bit on that, but not too much. Um, I did get the uh, second highest points for our club on this, uh, but uh, it really it came down to the time because I had two misses. Uh, the other shooter had two misses. Uh, but he had 5.7 seconds remaining. I had 3.8 seconds remaining. Uh, so my raw time was 116.2 seconds out of the 120 seconds allotted. So that gave me 3.8 seconds remaining. So that gave me a 0.38 bonus. So I had 83 point, or I'm sorry, 80.38 points uh, for that stage. So eight hits, 10 points per impact plus the 0.38 bonus. Uh, so you can see how you've got a lot of space there uh, to be able to widen the gap and spread the field out. So overall, um, that was a, a really good stage. Uh, the key to shooting this quick is you're shooting the same target array, strong side and support side. So when you finish your strong side, leave the gun in place, slide your body over and remount the gun. Don't try to move the gun uh, to the separate shoulder because the gun is already aligned on the target line. So just move your body over, get back behind it and then continue. And that is almost always gonna be the quickest way to shoot this. If you pick the gun up, now you've tilted the gun, you've gotta realign the gun, then you've gotta realign your body and then you've gotta get back behind it. So it's easier just to slide over behind the gun, realign your body behind the gun, Get on it and the gun's already on target. So that was can you beat the clock? Now our next stage was shots and ladders. So for this uh, we had a ladder and then at 80 yards we had a uh, 2.5 inch target uh, on a double hanger. So it was uh, hanging fairly high off the ground. Um, it is uh, again 120 seconds 10 shot round count. Uh, 10 points per impact, 100 points possible, and one piece of equipment in accordance with the NRL 22 rules. Uh, start position is standing, rifle in hand, mag in, action open. The description is on the start signal. Shooter will engage the target with one shot in the following order. Bottom step, second step, third step, fourth step, third step, second step, bottom step, second step, third step, fourth step. Firing one shot each. So there was a lot of movement on this. Um, no tricks, no real um, huge difference on this. Um, you had to be efficient with your movement and efficient with your support uh, to be able to get through this. Uh, I actually timed out before my last shot, so I only got nine shots off. Uh, I got eight impacts and one miss. Uh, I believe uh, I still actually got the highest score uh, on this, but I I could have done better. I could have run a little cleaner, um, but again, I was trying to be efficient with my time. Uh, there was at least one other stage on here where I ran it and left tons of time on the table. Uh, so you have to be careful with your time. You have to be efficient with your movement. Uh, so again, I ran the Wee Bad Mini Fortune Cookie and I set it with the opening so the ears of the fortune cookie up on either side of the fore end of the rifle. And I ran it just in front of the magwell. So on the uh, Voodoo, you've got a fairly straight, you've got a nice mag fence here and then a fairly straight magwell. So that gave me a really good uh, stop for the bag. And I just, throughout movement, every time I would go to move the gun, I would grab the bag and the fore end as one piece, pick it up, thread it out of the step and then thread it into the next step. Uh, the key here is to try not to move back too much and move forward too much because it's wasted movement. If you can just kind of lean back and then lean back in, um, it is much quicker. This is where a short rifle uh, without a suppressor uh, will save you some time because you don't have to come too far back. So if you have a 16 and a half inch barrel and no suppressor, uh, you can really thread it through those rungs quickly on the ladder. 
if you are running a uh, 22 or 24 inch barrel with a suppressor on the end of it, now you've got this javelin that you've got to pull out and thread into the next spot. Um, usually if I have the option on ladders, I like to run them top down. So I like to run high and then it's easier for me to come down than go up. Uh, the flip side of that is the bottom is usually your most stable positions. And so you never want to run out of time before you get down to the bottom stable positions, which are more sure shots. So again, um, pretty easy to run. Uh, some of our younger shooters, uh, my son in particular, uh, we just had to make really, really sure that as he was moving out and back in, uh, that he was safe with the gun. Uh, it's very easy, uh, and we forget this sometimes, very easy for younger shooters to get a little bit uh, uncoordinated and trip over themselves and all kinds of stuff. And when you have a comparatively heavy rifle and gear that you're trying to manage and you're trying to move forward and back, and there's a lot of things going on. Uh, so you need to have an adult that is ready to be able to take control of the weapon if um, they start to go in any strange direction. Uh, so just a safety hint there. I like these stages uh, because they really, they, they make you move up and down. They make you get back into position really quickly. And again, if you're not efficient, they can eat a ton of time. So that was shots and ladders. Next stage we had is all this up and down UG. So this was a um, unsupported stage. Time was 120 seconds. Round count was 10 rounds. The ranges and targets, at 50 yards we had a 6 inch target on a single hanger, at 100 yards we had a 4 inch target on a single hanger. The points were 10 points per impact, 100 points possible. Uh, the equipment was only a sling, and uh, the standing position is rifle in hand, mag in, action open. On the start signal, shooter will engage the 50 yard target from the unsupported standing position with three shots. Shooter will then transition to the unsupported prone, engage the 100-yard target with three shots. Shooter will then transition to the unsupported standing and engage the 50-yard target with two shots. Shooter will then transition to the unsupported prone and engage the 100-yard targets with two shots. So when you are standing, you're shooting at the 50. When you are prone, you are shooting at the 100. So it was standing, three, prone three, standing two, prone two for your 10 total. Um, again, this is a little bit of the efficiency, uh, but also how quickly you can get into that nice steady position. Uh, a sling really, really is a huge, huge, huge benefit on this. Um, my boy has not practiced with a sling, so we did not run a sling with his rifle. Uh, so he just had to try to use that uh, bone support and uh, muscular relaxation, which he is not that great at right now, uh, to get into position. But he made it work. He got a couple of hits. Uh, I was really, really proud of him. Um, me, on the other hand, uh, I got seven hits. Uh, and I got quite a few misses, and uh, my misses were almost all at the uh, longer target. I think I ganked a couple at the 50, uh, but they were all at the longer range target, and I noticed, um, you can actually see in the video, when I go down to the prone uh, for the second run, uh, I roll over and I grab the tail of the short action precision sling and yank on it. Uh, because I didn't feel like I had my sling tight enough. It was allowing my elbow to drift out, and so I wasn't underneath the gun, and I didn't have that really good uh, solid bone support on the forend. So that really did make a difference. Now, it's a four inch target at 100 yards. That's four minutes of angle. Uh, that's a very, very large target. If it was a prone bipod stage, you would have just beaten the heck out of the target and had no problems at all. But the nuances of getting that sling dialed in uh, to where you were down in position uh, is really important. So if your match director allows on this, it's a really good idea when you get up to the line, uh, go ahead and get slung up, uh, get the sling in a nice tight position for offhand, and then go ahead and drop down into your prone position and get into that prone position and find out if you're going to need to make an adjustment to your sling. Uh, some people can shoot both just fine. I can usually find an intermediate position uh, where it's uh, a little bit too 
tight in one position or the other and has to be slightly adjusted or it can just suck it up and deal with it. You need to make sure that you understand how your sling works. You need to make sure that your sling is a proper tension for each position. A loose sling really doesn't do you anything at all. So when you get up and you get your rifle into position, if there's slack in the sling, uh, it's not providing you any support, you might as well just ditch the sling. I can definitely say, and I think I say this every time, I need to get more time practicing uh, with the sling. Um, it's just something that I don't dial into my training routine, and mainly because uh, NRL 22 is the only competition that I really find that I have to use a sling almost every month. Uh, so I, I don't jump into it and practice it, although I really, really need to. So um, that again was all this up and down. Next we're getting to I'm getting tired, interestingly enough, because this was uh, a little ways on in the match. Uh, this is a 120 second time limit, 10 round round count. Uh, 75 yards, we had a 1.5 inch target on a double hanger. And at 100 yards, we had a two inch target on a single hanger. Uh, points were 10 points per impact, 100 points possible. And equipment is one piece of equipment in accordance with NRL 22 rules. The start position was standing, rifle in hand, mag in, action open. And on the start signal, shooter will take a position on the left side of the tire and engage each target with one shot each near to far. Shooter will then move to the right side of the tire and engage each target with one shot each near to far. Shooter will then move to the 55 gallon barrel and engage each target with one shot near to far. Shooter will move to the right side of the tire and engage each target with one shot from far to near. Shooter will then move to the left side of the target and engage each target with one shot from near to far. So a lot of things going on in this course of fire. Now match director note on here is the tire will be laying flat and the bipod cannot touch the ground. Painting a line down the middle of the tire will help with the left and right side. Tire, the rifle must be supported by the tire and the 55 gallon barrel will be standing upright. So a lot to unpack here. Um, first of all, um, we're shooting off a tire. So let's talk about gun setup real quick. Um, I saw a couple of different guys try to do things different ways. Uh, again, I was shooting the WeBad Mini Fortune Cookie. Let me grab that guy, which is right down here. So um, this is the WeBad Mini Fortune Cookie. Obviously, it looks like a fortune cookie for those of you guys that have not seen me mention it before. Um, and again, one of the reasons I like it is because there are a lot of options on how to use it. Uh, for this, I used it longitudinally like this. So I would set, set it like that underneath the rifle on the tire. And what that does is that gives me the longest surface area in contact with the barricade. And it ends up being like uh, two separate bags. So it stops that um, elevation wobble. Uh, now, you have to be careful where you set it on the tire because it would have a tendency to roll to one side or the other. So depending upon how the tire was constructed, uh, it may be more stable one direction or it may be more stable the other direction. If you had uh, a pretty good concave, then, then you might want to set the bulk of the bag towards the inside of the tire. Uh, so that was uh, that was the best way that I found to set up on the tire. And then it transitioned over to the top of the 55 gallon drum just fine. Again, that same orientation. And I spaced the gun back towards the close side of the top of the barrel. That way the magazine did not interfere with the barrel itself. If you have a gun like the Ruger here, uh, then when we support the forend, with the bag, the magazine protrudes below it. Uh, and so that can cause you a problem on the barrel uh, where the magazine high centers and you end up having problems getting your elevation to get the sights on target. Uh, so just be aware of that. So that worked for me, but uh, some other shooters um, were trying bipods, trying other things to, uh, to get a good stable position. Um, if I had been shooting the T1X in the ACC chassis, um, then I probably would have gone with the SkyPod for this because the SkyPod seems to rule 
when you use tires, uh, you can kick those legs out really wide and really flat. And then since for the NRL 22 rules, the bipod does not count as a piece of equipment, uh, I still would have been able to use the bag as a rear support underneath the pistol grip. Uh, and that would have got me really, really stable. Uh, with the SkyPod, with the legs out and the legs uh, as far extended as they possibly could go, that would allow me to offset just to the left of the axis of the center of the tire to be on the left side of the tire, and then switch it to the right to be on the right side of the tire. And then that same configuration would have worked when I got up onto the uh, top of the 55-gallon drum. Since I was shooting the Voodoo, the Voodoo is in a more traditional hunting stock with just a short pick rail in the front. So I was running a Harris, uh, or I'm sorry, an Atlas Cal bipod uh, on that, which did not give me the opportunity to kick the legs out uh, almost horizontal and the legs do not go wide enough to really run across the opening of a standard size car tire. So just a little bit on gun setup on there. Now, Running the actual course of fire, uh, you had to pay attention to what your engagement order was. Because again, you have a 75 yard and a 100 yard target. That's not terrible because uh, you can set your parallax and forget it. And then either you can work your elevation if you wanna work your elevation dial or do like I do, set the elevation dial on zero. And then I'm just using my one mil hold and my two mil hold marks in the uh, reticle to engage the 75 and the 100. Uh, and the rifle I was shooting, uh, depending upon the weather conditions was somewhere between uh, 1.7 and 1.9. Uh, for a 100 yard target, this is a rather large 100 yard target. Uh, so I could just run the two hash mark on the bottom edge of the target and get my hits on the actual target itself. So when you start the engagement, you're going to start the 75 yard target and then you're going to move to the 100 yard target. Now when you switch positions, you have to remember you're starting on the 100 yard target and then coming back to the 75 yard target. And then when you go up to the barrel, you're starting on the 75 yard target and then going to the 100 yard target. And then you're switching it back as you come back. Uh, so you always have to remember what target you ended on and that you're starting on the target you ended on uh, when you get to the next position. Uh, very easy to get tripped up on that. I fully expected that I was going to get lost in it and get messed up. Uh, if you have a gun problem, if you have a round that fails to go off, uh, we are working with 22s, etc. Uh, when you get into there, it's really easy to lose track. And then when you jump back out to hit your target, forget and get on the wrong target. So uh, this one wasn't too bad. I didn't get as stable as I would like to have gotten on the, uh, the tire. I was fighting the bag wanting to roll inboard uh, to the center of the target. I got six hits. I had four misses. Um, so not a spectacular performance, uh, but not horrible. Again, uh, if I was running an ARCA equipped chassis, I would have just run the sky pod, uh, and that would have stopped that tendency to roll because I would have been on the outer edges of the tires where it's much, much more stable. Our next stage is, are you confused yet? And again, this is 120 seconds, 10 round round count. Um, this one was not my favorite going into it, um, but I, I ran it fairly well. So we had three targets. At 50 yards, we had a one inch target on a single hanger. At 75 yards, we had a 1.5 inch target on a double hanger. And at 100 yards, we had a two inch on a double hanger. 10 points per impact, 100 points possible, and equipment was one piece of equipment in accordance with the NRL 22 rules. Start position is standing, rifle in hand, mag in, action open, and on the start signal, the shooter will take the prone position and engage the targets in the following order with one shot each. Stand by for this. 75 yards, 50 yards, 100 yards, 100 yards, 50 yards, 75 yards, 50 yards, 100 yards, 50 yards, 75 yards. So no order that you can program into your brain and go, okay, hit this and, and then roll with it. It's the same order for every shooter. So it's not like a Kim's game uh, that we've done in the past where um, you're either picking cards or you're, you're flipping things over to determine what your shooting order was. Everyone shot the same order, but it's a really wacky order. So you couldn't just say, I'm gonna run near to far, far to near, near to far, or any combination of those. 
So this is probably the first NRL 22 course of fire where I've ever had to break out a dope card. Uh, so I actually took a card out of my bag, wrote down my uh, ranges on it. I keep one of the uh, night eyes uh, twist ties, so it was really easy for me to wrap it around my scope and then clip my dope card uh, to the side of my scope. And that allowed me to keep track of uh, where I was at. Now for me, I just wrote the distances on them. Um, but when it came time for my son to actually shoot it, I went ahead and went back and I wrote the target numbers on it to make it a little bit easier for him. Um, at our local club, we found that we're working in such a confined space, a very smaller uh, rifle bay. We only have 100 yards deep. It's probably less than 100 yards wide, and uh, it's stair-stepped for 50, 75, and 100. Uh, so we end up with all our targets really crushed over into the right-hand side of the range. So we took a cue off of some of the other clubs, and we got some of the uh, sign hangers that you can get, uh, the lawn sign uh, hangers uh, that you can get at Lowe's. Uh, they just look like a little uh, wire curly cue and uh, made up some tags. And uh, Neil Burnett did a fantastic job on these. They're fluorescent colored. They have uh, A one or B, two or whatever on them. And we'll use A's for one target sequence, B's for another target sequence, C for another target sequence. That way um, we can set up a target sequence and you know which targets you're on because they're color coded and you know which target order engagement because of the numbers on them or usually the closest targets are lower numbers, the longer targets are higher numbers. Uh, that way it just makes it a little bit easier. So for this, we had, uh, I believe it was A3, A4, and A5 were the targets that we were shooting. Uh, so instead of doing 75, 100, whatever, I could do A4, A3, A5, and put this on this card. Uh, that way my boy could just see that he was engaging A3, so when he looks through a scope, he needed to make sure it's A3 next to the target that he's getting ready to shoot. So something just to make uh, it a little bit more comfortable for newer shooters or young guns. Uh, for me, I just needed the ranges because I, I can look through the scope and tell that uh, this is about how far away this target is and it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, a couple of tricks on this, not really tricks, but skill points, don't use too much magnification. Uh, too much magnification will increase the need to be on the spot on that parallax adjustment. Um, and too much magnification will make it difficult to swing from one target to the other. And you can very easily, especially if you don't have those markers, um, get tripped up and think you're on one target and be on the other. And that will both cause you a miss. And if for some reason you actually manage to hit, uh, then you're not going to get credit for the hit because it would be on the wrong target. Uh, so run lower magnification. I think I ran this one on uh, 10 or 12 power. Um, with the uh, Vortex 3 to 18, um, it's really pretty clear. And at that low power, the parallax is relatively forgiving. Uh, so I went ahead and adjusted parallax, I believe around that 75 yard mark. So I didn't have to mess with it at all. And because I knew I needed to be fast, because you're only getting one shot at each target, I left the turret zeroed out and I held with the reticle. Uh, and that actually allowed me to get through this and run the, uh, the course of fire clean. And I think I cleaned it with quite a few seconds left on the clock. Uh, I didn't write down what my end time was, but uh, I, I think I had quite a bit left when I came off of it. And that was the uh, the last stage of fire for the official NRL 22 courses of fire. Uh, we did do some uh, some rooftop shooting and uh, found out some interesting things about our rooftop. Uh, so our rooftop is uh, slanted. I don't know what the pitch is right now. We went with something uh, about in that intermediate, like 45 degree range. Um, but what we chose to do is actually Neil's idea is to screw slats across the uh, rooftop uh, on the lower half of it to give you something for your feet to bite into. Uh, we don't have skid tape or carpet or shingles or anything on it because we were trying to do a relatively lightweight rooftop that we can move in and out of storage uh, for each one of the uh, stages. Uh, the range that we're working on doesn't really allow us to pull a vehicle forward of the firing line to set things up and drop things off. So everything needs to be man portable. Uh, so we got a little bit of pushback uh, from it. 
uh, because that the slats weren't specifically called out, I guess, in the plans. Uh, Neil actually absorbed uh, most of the comments on that. I didn't even read them. Um, he just hit me up and asked me what I thought about it. And uh, for me, I think putting something that allows you to get a little bit better foothold on it, I don't think it really reduces the uh, skill level required to shoot off the rooftop. Uh, I do believe it increases the safety level a little bit because you really don't want people sliding off a rooftop with a loaded rifle. Uh, so we have to balance that, how difficult we're going to make things with still making it safe. Uh, when you start to get into some of our rainy days, which I, I think uh, last year it probably rained on more of our matches than it didn't. Uh, so you start to get in there and start to get mud or uh, grass or whatever drug up onto the rooftop. It starts to get really slick. Uh, what we actually found is uh, with my son especially, uh, he's not used to shooting off a rooftop. So when he got up there, he was really having trouble uh, digging his toes in and keeping his uh, position on the rooftop. Uh, so we may actually increase it a little bit and put a... put a two by four across it instead of uh, the little uh, one by slats that were on there. Uh, again, to make it more comfortable for our young guns, for our newer shooters to be able to do this. Um, I don't think it's a really big of a problem. Uh, if it is, then NRL 22 will make a ruling on it. Uh, but again, since what we're doing, the way the points are tabulated is across the club and then the percentage scores are submitted to national. I don't think making our rooftop easier um, really affects the spirit of the game uh, overall. And for me, it does, the style that I use shooting the rooftop, it doesn't really matter um, if the slats are thin slats, if they're two by fours, if it was a shelf built on there, because I I will put my toes in and I'm usually uh, usually wearing boots uh, if I know I'm going to shoot a rooftop. In this case, I was just wearing Solomons, which still give me uh, quite a bit of grip. So I just put my toes into the rooftop and then my knees above it, and that some rooftops will allow me to get elbow support on my legs and hold the rifle in. Um, but otherwise, that seems to give me one of the uh, best positions. Now, if I have nothing at all, and it's just a uh, standard rooftop with a fairly high pitch, and I don't have any uh, toe holds, and it's shingled, uh, then I'll usually put my hip and my side into it because that gives me more surface area uh, to grip the shingles. Um, that's I found works fairly well in the real world if I end up being stuck on a rooftop, which I absolutely hate rooftops. Um, but um, for the NRL, I, I think the uh, the rooftop, putting slats on it, uh, will help your newer shooters, it will help your less experienced shooters, and it will make the whole deal a little bit safer. But um, please, uh, if you think differently, then uh, drop a comment down below and let me know what you think. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, Ruger Precision Rimfire here. Uh, so, the RPR, I kind of have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with it right now. Um, the things that I love about it is it's a relatively inexpensive gun. The whole package sitting here, with the exception of the Atlas Cal bipod that we have on here, is relatively inexpensive. It comes in under $1,000. It is eligible for NRL 22 base class. Uh, so it's good to go. This one happens to be completely stock. Uh, there's nothing I've changed on it. We're even running the factory 15 round magazine in here. Um, it is a inexpensive rifle. It's already threaded for a suppressor if you want to run a uh, hearing safe match. Um, it is a shorter barrel, so it's easier to thread in and out of those barricades. Uh, the barrel is pretty much fully shrouded by the handguard, with the exception of the last couple inches here. And what that means for us is we don't have to worry about shooters resting the barrel on things, because unless you really get way out here, um, you're resting the handguard on something, which it aids newer shooters in getting accurate shots. Uh, if you rest the barrel on something, unless you have a really, really big target, uh, you're gonna run into issues with harmonics, you're gonna run into issues with deflection with the weight of the rifle causing the barrel to shift. Uh, it is a relatively thick barrel on here, which that kind of ticks both sides. 
Um, I wish it was a lighter weight barrel, again, for those newer shooters, but overall the rifle is not a heavy rifle. Uh, my 12 year old is not highly athletic, uh, but he didn't really have much of a problem uh, moving it around the barricades. He did have issues with it in the offhand stages, uh, holding it up, but again, that's just going to be getting him into a sling and getting him dialed in on that. The things that I dislike about it in factory form, uh, the selector is very stiff on this one, and I mean very stiff on it. Uh, so what that ends up being is it ends up being an excuse not to use the safety selector. Now, in NRL 22 competition, and this being a bolt-action rifle, that is not a huge deal. You can effectively leave the selector on fire, and then the bolt handle is your safety. If the bolt handle is up and back, the rifle obviously cannot fire. If the bolt handle is forward and down, then that is pretty much the same thing as your safety being on fire. Uh, so that is the way bolt action rifles are run through most precision rifle competitions. Uh, nobody really worries about the safety selector uh, because depending upon the trigger configuration, the safety selector may not be the deciding factor on if that rifle is actually safe or not. Uh, so watching the bolt is, uh, but it's there. I really wish it was a little bit smoother and that may be something where I have to break everything apart, uh, look in there and see if it's a detent that has a burr on it or what the deal is with it. And it may be something I can take care of later. I have not had this rifle detail stripped since we purchased it and uh, put quite a few rounds through it. Uh, second thing that I really, really dislike is the bolt is incredibly stiff uh, on this rifle. Uh, now it is really just this rifle. There are some other RPRs out there that are very smooth. Um, there are other RPRs out there that are not very smooth and are very stiff like this. So it's a quality control thing. Uh, I thought originally that it would break in and that it would slick up. Very often that happens with lower priced rifles uh, where the finish on them is not the greatest from the factory, but through use um, that finish smooths out. Uh, and then you get a much uh, much quicker action. Uh, that has not happened here. So again, I'm going to have to break it down. I'm probably going to have to put some lapping compound uh, on the bolt. And hopefully it will smooth out uh, that spot in the receiver and make it a little bit easier to run the bolt. Uh, Andrew was having quite a bit of problems uh, getting the bolt unlocked and getting it back. And we were shooting Norma Match 22 ammunition, so very high quality ammunition. So it's not a headspace issue with the ammunition. Uh, it is most definitely uh, the actual bolt itself. Um, last thing again, it's in the like and the dislike, is the buttstock on the RPR. Uh, I like the fact that it is fully adjustable and it has a very wide range of adjustments. So it's actually set for Andrew right now. It is too short for me. Uh, when I check the zero on his gun before we start the match, uh, it is difficult for me to get on the gun and get a solid shooting position because the buttstock is generally not in my shoulder uh, when I'm actually shooting it. Uh, however, it will go a little bit shorter. Uh, not much, just a little bit shorter. Um, so if you have uh, very young shooters, then you can really crank this thing down. The cheek piece has got quite a bit of adjustment, so uh, no matter what your scope height is, you can pretty much get it dialed in and get an appropriate comb height. Uh, the disadvantage of it is it is part of the plastic uh, lower receiver. So it is plastic. It is fairly sturdy. I mean, you really don't get much wiggle at all, if really any perceivable twist or wiggle out of it. Um, but what you don't have is the ability to switch this over to something else. Uh, so you're kind of locked into this buttstock on this rifle. I'm surprised that nobody yet has come up with any kind of uh, replacement adapter where you can cut this off and then bolt a new one on uh, to be able to use AR style buttstocks. Uh, but I don't know, maybe I just gave somebody a product idea out there. But again, that's that's one of the dislikes. There are aftermarket triggers available for it. I have not looked into that because the trigger in here is wholly sufficient. Uh, it is adjustable, but it does have the goofy little trigger blade in front of it, which I really don't like uh, the AccuTrigger style triggers. 
Uh, but again, that's, that's a personal preference. Um, I have not heard my boy complain about it. So there you go. Uh, it does have QD cups in the rear. You will need to put an M-Lock QD cup on the front uh, to run a sling on it. So that's the overall on the Ruger Precision Rimfire. Um, it shoots accurately enough for a base class rifle or for a young guns rifle. Um, this is my general purpose loner rifle. So uh, now that Andrew is shooting with me at the range uh, regularly, uh, then I may switch him over to the CZ. Uh, the CZ, it's not as quickly adjustable to a variety of different uh, stock configurations. Uh, so I originally purchased this one to see how well it worked, but then two uh, to be able to have a loaner rifle that I can quickly configure for adult or child at the range. Um, but the CZ, I can get that configured specifically to Andrew and it has a smoother, faster bolt. It's still a base class rifle and uh, get him set up on that. And then that still leaves the RPR as a loaner rifle. But overall, my opinion on it is the RPR uh, can be a great uh, young guns rifle. Uh, it's taken a beating. Uh, it's scratched up, scuffed up because of course it gets drug across ladder rungs. It gets bumped into barricades. Uh, the muzzle gets dropped on stuff. Uh, so it is what it is. Uh, you don't really want to give a newer shooter a super expensive rifle if you're not expecting to get that uh, rifle beat up. Um, most of us had to earn our spurs with uh, relatively inexpensive rifles. Uh, I My first rifle was a Remington 581, and I drug that thing all over the field. Uh, it still wears scars on its stocks uh, from many a, a rabbit hunting expedition uh, when I was younger. So um, expect any gun you hand to a young gun is going to get scratched up and scuffed up. Um, suck it up because uh, they will greatly enjoy the shooting and greatly enjoy the time and enjoy it even more so if they know that you are not worried about uh, little tiny things like scratches. So that's going to be it for this Mail Call Mondays. Um, this week, I'm actually taking vacation, so I'm trying to get this wrapped up and get it out and get it uh, staged so you guys will have a video to watch on Monday. Uh, if you have not already, make sure you watch the Tika T1X uh, Lothar Walther barrel replacement video that we posted last week. Um, that may give you some insight on why I was not shooting the T1X at this NRL 22 match. And uh, we are going to talk about the Voodoo sometime uh, next week after I get back off vacation because I have run that rifle quite a bit now. I'm fairly intimately familiar with it, and uh, it has some things that uh, I really love about it. has some things that I am not really in love about it with. Uh, so you'll make sure you want to watch that coming up. Um, we did not forget about the U.S. Optics Foundation 25X video. Uh, that rifle scope, uh, all the video is pretty much shot on it. I have one picture left I need to shoot, and then we will get the review out on it. Uh, that, again, is also one that you really are not going to want to miss, especially if you're in the market for a 5 to 25 power rifle scope. That's going to be it for this Mail Call Mondays. If you guys like the episode, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments over anything we've covered, drop it in the comments section down below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you guys want to support the content that you know and love, then please check us out on Patreon. For those of you that are already signed up over there, thank you very much. Uh, it makes it so much easier for us to do this with your support. And until next time, get out and shoot.